Welcome to the first of two discussions about the cardiovascular system and the heart. As you proceed in your careers, you will deal with many people with heart disease and with issues with their heart. So I think this will be a very, very interesting uh, unit, one that will pique the interest of everyone in the classroom. We spent a lot of time in Biology 105 discussing the, the structures of the heart, uh, the chambers, the flow of blood. Uh, you know about the valves. You know just a little bit about the cardiac cycle. So we'll, we'll be using that information to move forward. And this is also going to correlate really nicely with the upcoming labs uh, on the cardiovascular system and on reading EKGs. As you can see, we've got quite a bit for you to look over and just review. The first eight or so modules of the, ch of the chapter will... Uh, remind you about the structures of the heart, the valves, the, the chambers, the flow of blood, etc. So please do that. So I'm going to pass through these first slides. They're all there for you so that you have a, that advantage to look through them. But you know about the shape of the heart. You know about the location of the heart. Remember there's that pericardium that is surrounding the heart wall. And you know about the general features of the heart as you review these, these uh, sections. You'll also want to look at the cardiac chambers. Uh, you know, what are the four chambers and what's the heart's external anatomy? Think about the, um, the chordae tendinae inside. Think about the, um, the auricles on the outside, those, those coronary arteries and cardiac veins that are flowing along the sulcuses on the outside. The major vessels supplying the heart, of course, that's going to be the uh, inferior and superior vena cava bringing blue blood back in from the body, as well as the uh, coronary sinus, bringing blood back from the heart itself. And then you should be able to quickly and easily trace the flow of blood through the heart, uh, through the chambers, um, through the valves, etc. You should also, as you're thinking about the cardiac cycle, think about the atrioventricular valves and the semilunar valves and how they're going to open and close in response to uh, pressure changes within the heart. And finally, uh, look over this little section on atherosclerosis. So I'll zoom past those slides. And again, if, uh, even if you took Biology 105, I would definitely suggest that you at least read through this material to bring you up to speed. There was also a mention as we just passed through about cardiac muscle, and we've talked about cardiac muscle extensively. Nice, really, really nice review. Now I will say here, uh, when you're reviewing the coronary circulation, in the past I only referred to uh, the right and left coronary arteries. And those coronary arteries, as all arteries do, are going to continue to branch. And so here there is just a little bit more detail. And you will want to look at this information. Um, on where the right coronary artery goes. So you can see that it branches into the marginal arteries. That's going to be the surface of the right ventricle and the posterior interventricular artery, which is going to go to the interventricular septum and to the ventricles. So take a look at that specifically. And then the left coronary artery, this one uh, branches to the circumflex and that's going to go around, as it mentions, going around it's going to go around the coronary sulcus and uh, continue to branch off. And then there's the anterior interventricular artery, which makes sense. It's between the uh, anterior interventricular sulcus. Now, there's a number of anastomoses within the heart. Anastomoses is, remember, a, um, where two different, two different vessels come together. And this is a little bit unique in the heart. The heart definitely has more of these anastomoses in other places of our body. And these are going to allow uh, blood flow, even if there's a fluctuation in one area or if there's a slight blockage in one area, it's possible that that will not be uh, that important because there's another way for blood to get to certain areas of the heart. Remember, the cardiac muscle must have a continuous supply of oxygen. So just review where the um, circumflex marginal, and the an, uh, anterior interventricular uh, arteries flow. 
then here you can see the posterior interventricular artery. The coronary, artery, uh, coronary veins, also we just call them the great cardiac veins, um, and that is sufficient. They're going to flow um, along the heart, bringing blood back, and eventually all that blood from the cardiac veins is going to drain back into, as you know, the coronary sinus. So look at that little bit of extra information about the uh, specific names of the um, cardiac veins and the coronary arteries. Other than that, everything else through here should be very, very familiar to you. Recall that you can tell uh, that the left side is much more muscular, right? It has a much thicker myocardium than the right side. So that's something you should recall. And when the heart contracts, it actually does so in sort of a, a ringing of a mop mentality. So you see these circular arrangements, and the heart is squeezing and twisting all at the same time, and that's going to drive blood up and out of those ventricles. Remember that the um, semilunar valves are toward the base of the heart, and so the blood must be squeezed up and out through those valves. And a little mention of atherosclerosis. Okay, so that brings us up to where we're going to pick up with new information uh, for this semester. Uh, you've heard about the cardiac cycle a little bit. That is one heartbeat uh, to the next heartbeat is one cardiac cycle. We'll look at what's happening to the valves during those periods of time. And then we'll be continuing to look at the uh, conduction system. That is, uh, what are the electrical signals that are coming to and traveling through the heart. And we'll see what an action potential looks like in a cardiac muscle and see that it's a little bit different than an action potential in a neuron or in a uh, skeletal muscle. So uh, this idea of action potentials is certainly going to continue through this unit. We'll look at things that affect the heart rate. We'll look at this thing called stroke volume. That is how much volume of blood is pushed out of the heart with each stroke of the heart. And then we'll look at how those two things, um, stroke volume and another term, cardiac output, are maintained. And then we'll finish up looking at some EKGs. So the cardiac cycle, it's the period from the beginning of one heartbeat until the beginning of the next. And there are two basic phases within the cardiac cycle. The first is the contraction phase, that's the systole. And during systole, the heart is squeezing and blood is being pumped out into the next chamber or through the next valve. And then there's a relaxation phase or the diastole. And this is a time when the chambers are allowed to uh, rest and in doing so fill up with blood. So again we just see that the, the heart is going through cycles, alternating cycles of contraction and relaxation. Contraction is important, obviously the strength of contraction is important and the timing of contract, contraction is important. You would want both ventricles to contract at the same time. You would want both atria to contract at the same time. And relaxation is equally important because it's during that diastole or during that relaxation time that the heart is able to refill with blood. So what happens is that first the two atria are going to contract. That'll be just considered atrial systole. They're going to push blood uh, down into the ventricles. Now recall that the atria are not as muscular. They don't need to be. Uh, they're only squeezing enough to open the uh, atrioventricular valves the bicuspid and tricuspid valves, and in doing so, uh, gravity does a lot of the work and pushes the blood or allows the blood to go down into the ventricles. Uh, during atrial systole, the ventricles are in diastole, and so they're relaxing and waiting to be filled with blood. Then, the ventricles will begin to contract. This is ventricular systole. Honestly, when someone says systole, they're usually referring to ventricular systole, unless otherwise stated because the ventricles being the most muscular, uh, the more muscular of the chambers, they have to do the most of the work. And so when you just hear about systolic pressure or systole, it's usually referring exclusively to the ventricular systole. 
but this is now going to push blood up and out through the semilunar valves into either the pulmonary circuit or into the systemic circuit. And during this time, the atria above are relaxed and are refilling. And so you've got this cycle that occurs. And you have some pacemaker uh, cells. And we'll talk about the, the cardiac pacemaker system. And uh, we're going to see that this is going to last for about 800 milliseconds. Another way of writing that is 0.8 seconds. Okay, so the average cardiac cycle is going to be 0.8 seconds. That's less than a second. So again, you can see just in a cartoon here, the atria will first contract. Blood's coming in from the inferior and superior vena cava and a little bit from the coronary sinus as well. Comes into the right atrium. We also have blood coming over from the lungs into the left atrium. The two atria will squeeze simultaneously and blood will go down through the tricuspid and bicuspid valves into the ventricles. Then it'll be the ventricles turn and they will begin to contract. They'll do that squeezing and ringing motion. Blood will come up through the pulmonary semilunar and back behind the aortic semilunar valve. At this point, the two atria are relaxed. And around and around we go. So you can show the cardiac cycle in multiple different ways. Here is uh, one with some timing on it. Again, 800 milliseconds being the average complete cardiac cycle. So for the first 100 milliseconds or so, 0.1 seconds, the atria are in systole. They're contracting. Then the rest of the time, you see it in green here, the rest of the time the atria are relaxed. So the atria are only contracting for a short period of time out of the whole 0.8 seconds. Then the ventricles will begin to contract, and you can see that their contraction lasts a lot longer, about 270 or 0.27 seconds. And then the ventricles are staying relaxed. During some which of time, the, the atria are contracting. And the whole thing, right, the whole thing, 0.8 seconds. Again, this is an average. So we're going to think about the cardiac cycle beginning when all four chambers are relaxed. There is a time, if you go back and look, there is a time when everything is relaxed, right? Um, here there's atrial diastole and ventricular diastole. So there's a fair amount of time where everything in the heart is relaxed. So we'll start there just for our conversation. This is going to allow... Um, the blood to be filling into the atria, and then the atria will undergo systole, again, 100 milliseconds. Then, for about 270 milliseconds, the atria will be in diastole. They'll be continuing to fill up. Again, we're doing this entire conversation for a heart rate of 75 75 beats per minute, okay? And what 75 beats per minute corresponds to, if you think about it, 75 beats a minute, if we have 0.8 seconds and we have 60 seconds per minute, if I take 60 and divide it by the 0.8 seconds, so that's 60 seconds per minute over 0.8 seconds, right? That's going to give me 75. Okay, so 75 beats per minute is this average uh, 0.8 second cardiac cycle time. So then once the atria have squeezed, and we're going to go into the ventricular systole. At this point, the AV valves are going to close. So the AV valves open when the atria were contracting. 
When the ventricles begin to squeeze, the AV valves are going to close. There is not yet enough pressure to open up the semilunar valves. And during this time, we have a period called the isovolumetric contraction. In other words, the heart is beginning to contract, but there's isovolume, right? There's the same amount of volume in the ventricle. Now, in the second phase of the ventricular contraction, the ventricular systole, then there's going to be an increased pressure. Remember from Boyle's Law that as pressure and volume are inversely related, and so as the ventricle is beginning to squeeze, that means that the volume, the space will be smaller, and the pressure will increase. So at some point, those two semilunar valves are going to open up, and now blood will be pushed out of the ventricle in what's referred to as ejection. So ventricular ejection is when the heart is actually pushing the blood up and out through the semilunar valves into the aorta or into the pulmonary trunk. Then the ventricles will begin to relax, ventricular distally, and during this time the pressure will begin to drop and blood will flow back a little bit against the semilunar valves okay, and close those valves. And then there'll be a time of isovolumetric relaxation. So a time where um, there's a relaxation, but there's no change in volume. And that would be because the AV valves are still closed. They have not opened up, and therefore more blood is not being introduced into the ventricles. And then finally, uh, in, in late ventricular diastole, all chambers will be relaxed. The AV valves will reopen and now blood will come back into the ventricle. So all of these timings are important for you to know, to appreciate what's longer and what's shorter, and you'll see that the ventricular diastole lasts about 530 milliseconds. Um, 430 milliseconds to the end of that current cycle plus 100 milliseconds into the next cycle uh, during which the atria are in systole. So again, here's the same circle, but now we have some pictures added to it. So we begin where everything is in rest, in diastole. The atria will contract, then the atria will relax. Then the ventricles will begin isovolumetric contraction, and then eventually push open and do ejection. And then the ventricles will relax. There'll be isovolumetric relaxation, and then finally late diastole of the ventricles. Now, the valves do not open and close automatically. These are not like a cuckoo clock where, you know, every 0.8 seconds, suddenly a valve flies open and a little bird pops out. That's what I always think about. Instead, something is causing these valves to be pushed open, and that's going to be pressure. So as the blood is, uh, as the chambers are squeezing and as the pressure is increasing, at some point, those valves will be pushed open more like saloon doors. So someone had to push those doors open for them to open. And when that occurs, so there's an increase in the pressure that opens up the valve. And then there'll be a drop in pressure that will close the valve. Okay, and this is what's going to happen over and over and over. There's a lot of, a lot of elasticity in the walls of the heart. So we'll see how this is always going back to its original shape. This is one of those graphs that you really need to stare at for a while and really dig into and own. You just need to know this graph. You'll be interacting with this graph on mastering assignments, so I think that you'll, you'll get enough practice with this, but this is really, really important. There's a lot of things on this graph. Let's start off. So here we've got the pressure, okay, on this axis, and that's always going to be in millimeters of mercury. So get in, the, get in the habit of writing millimeters of mercury after all of your pressure value, values. Here's the pressure of the aorta, this black line at the top. The red is the pressure of the left ventricle, and the blue is the pressure of the left atrium. The, again, when you're thinking about overall in the heart, you're going to be dealing with the left side more than the right, because the left side is more muscular. Uh, we'll be dealing with the volumes here. Um, the volumes are the same on the right side. The pressures are a little bit different, though. So let's take a look. So um, here, if we go across the top, 
there's your ventricular diastole, your ventricular systole, and then back to rest. So the ventricles are about to, they're in rest, so you see pretty much a flat line here for the pressure of the aorta. And then as they begin to squeeze, all of a sudden there'll be enough of a pop and the aortic semilunar valve will open up. So this is the increased pressure, okay? And during the increased pressure, the valve, the aortic valve will open, and then it'll drop, and the pressure will drop low enough that the aortic valve will close. So this top red line This black line, I should say. This is just the pressure of the atria, okay? Relatively high. Let's take a look at the left atrium, okay? The pressure overall is much, much less. So you see that during atrial systole, there's a little rise. It's not a huge difference, is it? Remember, the atria don't have to do a lot of work. So a little bit of an increase in the, in the atria and then a little increase again, okay, as the valves open and close. So that there's not that much pressure in the atria. But look what goes on here with the ventricle. This is where there's an amazing pressure change. So we go along and kind of low, and then, oh my, the left AV valve will, will close, and now the pressure in the ventricle is going to increase, 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 and then it will come way back down. So the ventricles are really squeezing lots and lots of pressure changes as we contract. The steps over here will walk you through this. Again, you need to be able to, to walk through this graph and think about each of these seven steps on this pressure graph. We have time on the bottom. Again, milliseconds. So another, if you look at this from zero to 800 milliseconds, the next the next cardiac cycle would start right about here. Okay, and you see it starting to, to mirror the beginning here. Now, it, when you hold a stethoscope up to your heart, we know we hear lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Lub is S1, that is the first heart sound. And it is marking essentially the start of ventricular contraction and it's produced in part as the AV valves close. Those AV valves close very percussively. And as they close in synchrony, you can hear lub. That's the longer of the two sounds. Then there's dub, S2. And this is going to occur largely when the semilunar valves close. When those valves close, there's a big pushing of blood on those closed valves. And so between the closing of the valves and the, and the blood, being forced off the wall of the, of the uh, chamber, that is where these sounds are coming from. Now, S3 and S4, I, don't, I won't deal with very much, but there are some very faint and not often heard sounds in adults. So if you look on the bottom, S1, right, the longer, louder, lub, and then S2, dub. So you should be able to go back now and tell me where on this graph you would hear lub and dub. Okay, remember it's going to be where the valves close. So you would expect to hear, if you look at this timing across the bottom, you would expect to hear, right, AV valves are closing, S1, aortic valve closes, S2. Okay, so that's your timing of S1 and S2. S1, S2 on this graph. So let's put this together. We now know about how the heart is uh, squeezing. We know the atria, then the ventricles. We know what valves are being pushed open. We know the direction of blood that is flowing through the heart. Cardiac output um, is a very, very important concept, and that is how much blood is being pumped by the left ventricle? Again, we're going to think left ventricle. It's going to be the same as the right ventricle, okay? 
Remember, the, the volume has to be the same on the right and left side of the heart or else there'll be a big backup somewhere. So in normal heart physiology, we're just going to think about the left ventricle going into the systemic circulation, going into the aorta. So the definition of cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by the left ventricle into the aorta each and every minute. This is going to depend upon two things. It's going to depend upon heart rate, how often the heart is beating every minute, as well as the stroke volume. And the stroke volume is going to be the amount of blood pumped out of the ventricle with each and every heartbeat. So the relationship is simply going to be this. Cardiac output is going to equal the heart rate times the stroke volume. Very simple relationship. So we see here in a more of a picture, picture, uh, picture heart rate times stroke volume equals cardiac output times so I told you that the average heart is beating 75 times a minute we know that because 0.8 seconds per cardiac cycle is less than one minute or sorry less than one second there's 60 seconds in a minute, therefore your heart rate would be higher than 60. So at 0.8 seconds, you have a heart rate of 75 beats per minute. And I'm telling you now that uh, about 80 mils of blood is going to be pumped out with each and every beat of the heart. So that means that, on average, 75 beats per minute times 80 mils per beat coming out of the left ventricle is going to give you a cardiac output of about 6,000 milliliters per minute, or 6 liters per minute. Now, how much blood do you have in your body? You have a little bit less than 6 liters. So the way I always think about it, that means that every drop of your blood is pretty much being pumped around your body every minute. I mean, that's on average, of course. Some, some blood cells would have a short trip down... Uh, to the cardiac muscle or maybe down to the, to the kidney and back, but others would make it all the way down to your big toe. But on average, um, about a minute, circulation. All the blood is circulating through your body. Now, this cardiac output can change quite a bit. So during, your, during exercise, your heart rate can go way up. And the stroke volume can also go up. So this can go up much, much higher. This is sitting at rest. So six liters per minute at rest, that's just a good number to remember as a, as a ballpark figure. Now how does this work? What is causing the heart to initiate the cardiac cycle? Well, this is called the cardiac conduction system and there are a series of specialized cardiac muscle cells that are responsible for initiating the electrical signal. These cells are going to be autorhythmic automatic. They, they have what's called auto autorhythmicity. And they're going to initiate this electrical signal without connection to the brain, without connection to other nerves, and without direct connection to hormones. We will see that the brain and hormones can influence this conduction system. But the heart has within itself these pacemaker cells that are going to initiate the cardiac cycle. Now where are these cells? Well there is a patch of the right atrium called the SA node, the sinoatrial node. And these are the most important of the pacemaker cells. You can't tell them apart, you can't look under the microscope and say oh that is a pacemaker cell, but there's a patch of these cells found within the right atrium that are these pace, pacemaker cells and they are going to have a different um, series of, of a different looking action potential and are going to have um, leaky channels that we'll see later on that are going to bring these cells to threshold quite often and they're going to fire action potentials and then there are signals right this conduction system is a series of nerve-like structures that are going to then travel through the atria on the way to the ventricles and we would call those the internodal pathways. We know that means between the nodes. 
Well, between the nodes suggests there must be another node, and there is. There is the AV node, or the atrioventricular node, and these cells are right where the name tells you they are. They're right at the junction of the atria and the ventricle, and here there are also some pacemaker cells. They're basically the heart's backup system. Uh, we'll see how they will be a part of every cardiac cycle, but should there be damage to the SA node, they also can maintain the heart rate not as fast. The SA node is going to keep us going at about uh, 72 beats per minute on average. The AV node can keep the heart beating at 40 to 60 beats per minute. Okay. And this can change. I mean, this can go up as high as 230 beats per minute. So the heart can go much, much faster. But at normal times, the SA node is going to be the, the driver of the cardiac cycle, and the AV node will be a relay station. But during damage to the SA node, the AV node can take over as the primary place. And we'll look at these pictures in a moment. Then from the AV node, there's what's called the AV bundle, and then the bundle branches. These structures are going to go through the interventricular septum. Right between the ventricles, there is a divider, the interventricular septum. And... Um, this is the connection between the atria and the ventricles. The bundle branches then continue down along um, the wall toward the heart's apex. Remember, that's the point. And the left branch will go to the left ventricle and the right to the right side. And the left is larger. Remember that the left ventricle is much more muscular. There are also Purkinje fibers. These Purkinje fibers are large diameter cells. Uh, they are very, very fast, and they're the very last part of the conduction system. So let's put this together in a picture. The SA node, here this patch of cells, more on the superior section of the right atrium. Um, the models that we have in the lab make it look like it's almost at the border of the superior vena cava coming down into the right atrium is where the SA node is located on the model. And then that signal is going to travel through internodal pathways to the AV node and then go down the interventricular septum. We have the bundle branches going down toward the apex and then coming up through the Purkinje fibers. Now this is also happening, the SA node is only on the right side, but what this is not showing is that there would also be signals going over to the left atrium, and uh, both of the atria would be contracting at the same time as a result. What's going to allow for the rapid electrical signal to travel from one side of the heart to the other side is our good old friend, the intercalated discs, right? So the intercalated discs, more about those, but we've been hearing about them for a long time. You know that's what you are looking for for identification of the cardiac muscle, but the intercalated discs are also basically gap junction and uh, desmosome-like um, structures that are going to allow that electrical signal to travel from one cell to the next very, very quickly. So when you're in your book and you're looking through the module, please pay attention to this one. This is 1911. And in this, it's just going to walk you through step-by-step uh, step from the SA node, traveling, and then you see how it's traveling over to the left side as well, through the atria, about 50 milliseconds of time. And then there's going to be a little bit of a delay before it gets down to the AV node. The AV node is going to also be an elapsed time of about 150 milliseconds. And then eventually uh, down the bundle branches, down toward the apex, and then around the Purkinje fibers. And each of these steps, there is an amount of time that's going to elapse. Now let's compare this with uh, this cardiac muscle contraction with skeletal muscle. We know a lot about skeletal muscle. Uh, we've been learning a lot about it. We know that the action potentials in skeletal muscle are rapid. 
uh, very quick, and that at the end of that, we would say that a twitch has occurred, right? A twitch contraction. Um, after the action potential, the muscle will then contract. Again, the, the twitch contraction is very, very short, and we know the whole story about how the acetylcholine would be released, picked up by the ligand-gated channels on the motor end plate, travel along the sarcolemma, down the T-tubules, and then their voltage-gated calcium channels would open at the sarcoplasmic reticulum, bind to the troponin that is wrapped around the actin short filament, uh, the thin filament, and then allow the, the uh, sliding filaments to uh, move over each other. And so we know that story. And there is a refractory period of time when, um, from the beginning of all this until peak tension can develop. There is possible for those twitches to summate, add together, and for tetanus to occur. Now, we said that was a rather rare thing to occur, but it can occur uh, if the calcium is not taken back up, the muscle can go all the way to uh, tetanus. So on the top, this is skeletal muscle, and we're looking at the action potential um, of skeletal muscle, very, very up and down fast, and the contraction that follows thereafter. Remember we talked about there's a little bit of a, of a, of a lapse, a period, and muscle does have a refractory period as a result. Now these are very, very short. Look at those times in the milliseconds. Let's compare that though with cardiac muscle. What we're going to see is that the action potential here is a lot different. It's much longer and we're going to see that calcium will once again be very, very important for the proper action potential of the cardiac muscle. The contraction period is going to be longer, 250 milliseconds and therefore a longer refractory period as it continues into relaxation. This very, very long contraction period is going to assure that there's never any tetanus to the heart. This is important because if the heart would ever went into tetany, it would no longer be able to pump blood. So there's no way that the heart can reach tetanus. That, that, that is, there's no way the heart will ever stay in a contracted state. So here is an action potential curve for cardiac muscle. And boy, this looks a lot different, doesn't it? Remember a moment ago we saw the action potential for skeletal muscle, and we just went right up and right back down, didn't it? So here we see a much longer, what we call a plateau, and this long plateau, so it's not going to repolarize anywhere near as quickly, and that's going to also, as you can see, there's going to be a little bit longer of a latency as we reach our peak tension and then come back down. But a much longer period of time for contraction and a much longer action potential. Now there's three. We're going to break down the cardiac action potential. and It's similar. The story is very, very similar. There's just a couple of unique uh, players in this cardiac action potential. So just like before, there's a rapid depolarization that is going to be very, very similar to skeletal muscle. It's still going to be sodium gates that open, voltage-gated sodium gates are going to open, and there's going to be an influx of sodium. That has all the same. Nothing different. Where things are different, though, is that the cardiac action potential, there's that long plateau, and it will get up to around zero and kind of stay there. And the reason is this. There are going to be some voltage-gated calcium channels. This is brand new that are going to open, allowing some influx of calcium. And they are slow channels. So they're going to open slowly, and they're going to remain open for quite a period of time. And that is going to keep the action potential up right at this plateau. It's not going to allow it to come straight back down like we would expect to see. So it's going to maintain this much longer plateau, and that's all because of the voltage-gated calcium channels. And then the repolarization, again, it takes longer for those calcium channels to close. And potassium channels will again open, but it's all about that calcium as to why we stay at the, at the high level. So let's take a look at this. So we have this rapid depolarization. We're accustomed to that. That's the sodium rushing in. 
and then up here we get to a peak of around positive 30, just like any action potential, but then there are these slow voltage gated calcium channels that are going to keep everything at this plateau. This is going to keep the heart in a long absolute refractory period. Again, preventing the heart, there's no way the heart can ever reach tetanus because of this long absolute refractory period. There's no way another action potential can be generated during this absolute refractory period. So there's no way there would be summation of the signals leading to tetanus. So what is running this? What is causing this, um, the pacemaker cells to fire? We'll call this the pacemaker potential. Now, we've talked about skeletal muscle action potentials. We know what those look like. We know now that the cardiac muscle um, has a different looking action potential that keeps the cardiac muscle from going into tetanus. Now I'm going to be looking at the pacemaker cells. So these are those little nodes of cells that are in the SA node and the AV node. Now these cells themselves are different. So we're going to look at a third action potential curve. So these pacemaker cells are in the SA node and the AV node. And what's unique about them is they cannot maintain a stable resting membrane potential. So they're always drifting toward threshold. And we're going to see that that constant drifting toward threshold is going to keep these cells moving, you know, moving through action potentials. The SA node does this the fastest. So 80 to 100 times a minute, your SA node cells are going to initiate an action potential. That's what's going to establish the heart rate. Now, it's that impulse from the SA node that's going to travel to the AV node the AV node will then reach threshold and go down the bundle branches and down the Purkinje fibers. Here is what this looks different. So this is the membrane potential of the SA node. Okay. And what you see is that about a negative 60 resting membrane potential, but it doesn't stay there very long. It never really stays at RMP. It's always drifting up toward threshold. It does the action potential and then comes back down. And again, doesn't stay at resting membrane potential, has leaky channels, and it's going to go back up to a threshold, reach threshold, and go back up again. So look at the timing. About every 0.8 seconds, that is 75 times per minute. Again, this is on average at rest. The SA node is going to fire and cause an uh, a atrial uh, systole and begin another cardiac cycle. Now, I told you that the heart is autorhythmic and that it does not need nerve or hormonal signals to initiate the uh, cardiac cycle, and that's absolutely true. However, it is possible, and you know this, for the autonomic nervous system to influence the heart rate. It doesn't initiate it, but it can influence. So the parasympathetic division rest and digest, actually can slow down, relax the heart rate, and lengthen the time before it'll reach threshold. So parasympathetic stimulation, what's going to happen is that, again, this is all acetylcholine, and what it's going to do is open up some potassium channels, this is going to slow down how quickly the spontaneous depolarization will occur. It will also extend the time in repolarization, and as a result, will slow down the heart rate. So I told you a moment ago that the, let's go back, I told you a moment ago that the SA nodes would, on their own, fire 80 to 100 times a minute. But I'm telling you that on average, our heart only beats 75 beats per minute. So that means that there is an influence of the parasympathetic nervous system all the time, what's ca called parasympathetic tone. And that is going to help keep your heart rate down at the 
75 or so beats per minute. So we can see here that with parasympathetic stimulation, there's always a little bit of parasympathetic stimulation going toward the heart through the cardiac plexus that the heart rate gets slowed a little bit. Okay. It brings the a slower depolarization. It slows down this leakiness up to threshold by also driving it down lower below threshold. That was through those potassium channels. Now, the sympathetic division can also have an effect. So when the bear is chasing you, you know that your heart rate goes up. And what's going to happen is that under sympathetic simulation, there's going to be binding of norepinephrine. Epinephrine is going to bind to some beta receptors on um, the heart, which is going to open up some ion channels. This is going to increase the rate of depolarization, decrease the repolarizing time, and therefore increase the heart rate. We look at the same graph, and now we see that the normal heart rate is 0.8 seconds, but oh no, this one's going to happen much more quickly. So it's less time, and there's a more rapid depolarization as well. You don't see as deep of a resting membrane potential, and you'll see that it takes less time for the cell to reach threshold. So the heart rate goes up as a result. Again, these numbers vary with individuals, with your age, with your overall health, and with your physical conditioning, but we're going to say your normal heart rate is 60 to 100. Okay. So some of you might be uh, at a normal resting heart rate of 60 beats per minute up to 100. This is your normal range. Okay, 60 to 100 will be considered a normal range. Anytime the heart is beating slower than 60 times a minute, we're going to call that bradycardia. Anytime it's over 100, we're going to call it tachycardia. We know brady means slow, tachy is going to mean fast. So bradycardia and tachycardia. They, you, could, you could have a resting heart beat of 59, and if that's your normal, that's fine. Uh, athletes tend to have a lower heart rate. Their hearts are in better shape. They're more efficient, so they don't have to beat quite as often. So just to put this graphically, here's our normal range, 60 to 100. And tachycardia over 100, bradycardia less than 60. So what part of your brain um, is regulating this? Again, 60 to 100 is normal. The pacemaker cells will initiate this on their own. But you also appreciate that your heart rate can go up. If you're nervous, if you're upset, if you're emotionally uh, disturbed, your heart rate will go up, right, if you're scared. It will go up. So certainly we know that the autonomic nervous system can have an effect on your heart rate. You know your brainstem can have an effect. You know about the amygdala. If you're scared, if you're angry, you know that your heart rate's going to go up. So we, we can appreciate that there must be a part of the brain that does help control the overall heart rate. And that is centered in the medulla oblongata. And this is the cardioaccelatory center and it's going to control the sympathetic neurons and can increase your heart rate. So these, these uh, signals are going to travel down through the cardiac plexus, through the cardiac, the cardiac nerves, through the cardiac plexus, and they're going to innervate directly on the SA node and influence the conduction system of the myocardium. So again, it doesn't initiate it, but it can influence the heart rate. There's also the inhibitory center, also the medulla oblongata. This is going to be parasympathetic neurons, and they're going to decrease the heart rate. Now, these are traveling through the vagus nerve. Remember the vagus, the 10th cranial nerve? It's wandering, and it also goes down through the cardiac plexus to the nodes. I mentioned this already. Normally, your resting heart rate is slower than the intrinsic rate. Intrinsic rate means... Um, what the SA node would want to do. So the SA node wants to fire between 80 and 100 beats per minute. That's its intrinsic rate, but the actual rate is only about 75, right? Actually, we said 60, right, to 100, but an average around 75. So we see that the heart actually beats slower than its intrinsic rate, and that's because there's always a little bit of parasympathetic innervation going to the heart. Again, that's called sympathetic 
tone. So, again, within the medulla oblongata, within the brainstem, there are centers, and we can see that these centers are traveling down to the heart. Here's the, in the inhibitory center. So this is going to be parasympathetic signals coming down, causing the heart to slow down or maintain a slower heart rate. And there are accelerator centers that are going to travel down and are going to influence, and you see them going straight down to the SA node and to the AV node, and they're going to influence and increase the heart rate. So I mentioned that cardiac output, cardiac output was equal to stroke volume times heart rate. We've just been talking about heart rate, right? Increasing and decreasing heart rate based upon sympathetic and parasympathetic influences. Now let's look at the other part of cardiac output, that is stroke volume. Again, if this was like an old-fashioned pump, each time you push down on the handle, right, so much water would come out of the spigot. It's the same idea. Each time the heart squeezes ventricular systole, how much blood is pumped up and out into the semilunar valves. So that's what we're referring to here. And even though there are two pumps, two ventricles, they pump the same volume. So we're gonna use we're gonna think about it as a single pump, okay? In this case. So again, think about the old hand uh, old water pump and as you raise it, a certain amount of water comes up and through. Same idea. Now, here's a new term for you. At the start of the cardiac cycle, the water that's already in the ventricle at the end of diastole, we're going to call this the EDV, end diastolic volume. So at the beginning of the cardiac cycle, before anything's begun, there's a certain amount of blood that's in the ventricle at the end of relaxation, EDV. And then as the heart begins to squeeze, there's going to be ventricular ejection. At the end of the ejection, when all the blood has been squeezed out as the heart rings around and twists, the amount of blood left in the ventricle at the end of that is called the ESV, the end systolic volume. How much volume was at the end of the squeezing period, the systolic, the systole. So now what we have is that the stroke volume, how much blood is going to be pumped out, is mathematically related to EDV minus ESV. In other words, how much did I start with? And then how much got squeezed out? Right, or how much is left at the end, sorry. So how much did I start with? How much is left when I'm all done? The difference is how much was pushed out, or the stroke volume. So looking at it graphically then, start here, and we see that there's going to be a certain amount of blood um, in the heart, okay? And that's going to be the EDV. And then as the heart starts to squeeze, blood is going to be pushed out, and there'll be a certain amount of blood left behind. That'll be the ESV. And how much went out, right, the stroke volume, will be the EDV minus the ESV. Now, what can affect the stroke volume? What can uh, influence? Let's first talk about the EDV. Stroke volume equals EDV minus ESV. So let's talk about first EDV. What can influence EDV? Well, for, certainly venous return. If there isn't as much blood coming back to the heart, then that would certainly reduce the volume. It would reduce your EDV. If your heart was um, contracting more often, if there was an increased number in contractions, 
That means there wouldn't be as much time in between the contractions. Therefore, there wouldn't be as much time for the ventricles to fill with blood. So the faster the heart is beating, the less time there is for filling, the lower the EDV would be. And then also, increased flow. So your, your EDV can be, um, can be increased with flow. And I've already mentioned the filling time. Okay, so um, depending on how fast everything's going, if your heart rate is much faster, there'll be less time, your EDV will be decreased above it. If your heart is slower, then your EDV would be increased. Let's put all this together. What else can affect EDV? is this idea of preload. Preload is the amount of stretch on the heart. The greater the end diastolic volume equals a larger preload, which equals a greater stroke volume. Now, the person who described this relationship is was two people, Frank and Starling. So they share this law called the Frank-Starling Law of the Heart. Basically, what it says is that the more blood you put into the ventricle, the greater the increase in pressure, sorry, the increase in volume of the ventricle will be an increased stretch. And with that increased stretch on the ventricle, the heart will actually beat stronger. So not only um, will you eject more blood, but you'll eject that blood more powerfully. There'll be stronger contractions and the whole heart will be more efficient, if you will, during the contraction phase. So the more you stretch the heart by putting more blood into a chamber, Frank and Starling discovered that the heart will respond to that increased volume with a more powerful contraction and eject more blood. Now what can influence ESV? And that is this idea of contractility. Contractility is how much force your heart will squeeze with. If your contractility is decreased, if your heart's not able to squeeze as hard, then it makes sense that your amount of blood pumped out would be decreased as well. And this contractility can be influenced through hormones and drugs. It can be increased through sympathetic stimulation, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine when you're scared, your heart is going to beat not only faster, but harder. So when you're being chased by the bear and your heart is beating fast, you might say, oh, it feels like my heart's going to come out of my chest. Absolutely. Not only is it beating faster, it's also beating, beating harder with greater contractility. This can be blocked. Contractility can be blocked by some beta blockers and some calcium channel blockers. The calcium channel blockers may make sense as you think about what we described in the calcium uh, influence in the cardiac cycle. Uh, beta blockers are a series of drugs that would interfere with this and help keep someone's heart rate down, their blood pressure down. What else can influence ESV is afterload. And afterload is considered the tension necessary for the ventricles to eject. So a greater afterload will decrease stroke volume. Basically, anything that restricts the heart from pushing blood out. So if there's any sort of restriction in arterial blood flow, any kind of vasoconstriction, it would make it more difficult for the heart to squeeze that blood out, and therefore we would say that the afterload is increased. So I need you to put those terms together. Afterload, preload, contractility, EDV, ESV, stroke volume, and in the um, worksheets, the Martini worksheets, there's some nice worksheets in Chapter 19 that will help you better understand the relationship between cardiac output, stroke volume, heart rate, and how preload and contractility can influence that. 
and I will make sure that some of the mastering assignments also walk you through this a few times so you begin to see how all of these work together. Now, finally, what affects cardiac output? Put all this together. All of this together is going to increase your cardiac output. So cardiac output is going to change a lot based upon your metabolic needs. Your heart is going to change based upon your body's needs. Heart failure is any time where the heart can no longer meet those needs. So even though your body needs more blood, it can no longer provide it. So you're in some sort of heart failure. Again, cardiac output can be changed by either the heart rate or the stroke volume. So you can imagine um, if I increase the heart rate, the, the cardiac output will go up. If I increase the stroke volume, the cardiac output will go up. And that is true for the most part. We'll, we'll, we'll mention a couple of, of, uh, of uh, slight variations on that as we go through this. So again, here's your normal range. Cardiac output, right? about 18 to 30. Um, this is during heavy exercise. What did I say normal was? Right? I said normal was down here around 6. So 6 liters is your resting cardiac output. During exercise, it can go up to 18 to 30 liters per minute. And highly trained uh, athletes can go much higher than that. If you're no longer, though, able to, if your heart failure, heart disease is going to decrease this cardiac output and basically make it impossible to increase uh, levels necessary to exercise. So putting this together then, you can see the factors that affect heart rate. Certainly exercise will increase heart rate. So exercise or body temperature. Autonomic nervous system can certainly influence sympathetic stimulation is going to increase the heart rate. Parasympathetic is going to decrease it. And hormones can also, uh, epinephrine, thyroxin, remember we talked about thyroxin being, uh, thyroid hormones being part of your metabolic, uh, basal metabolic rate. And so they can also influence your heart rate. So overall, heart rate, right, is influencing cardiac output. So what I've described to you is all put on this next table. You need to stare at this. You need to refer back to this. This is figure 19-15 uh, in your textbook. And it's going to go through and discuss to you, discuss with you the uh, what can affect stroke volume, right? And um, that also is going to have a lot of impact on cardiac output. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about in this lecture will be ECGs or EKGs. Uh, my training, I usually just say EKG. It's more the, the Germans uh, spelling for cardio with a K. Uh, English, more ECG. So forgive me as I flip back and forth between ECG and EKG. They're both acceptable. So in lab, you're going to be doing EKGs uh, this coming week and learning a lot about this. So everything I'm saying here will be emphasized and retaught to you uh, in lab, and I think this will all come together really, really nicely for you. In order to understand EKGs, you have to understand the cardiac cycle, you have to understand the timing of the cardiac cycle, and what's going on as far as different chambers uh, in uh, systole or in diastole. So an EKG is an electrical activity of the heart we're measuring it from electrodes on the body surface. We did something similar with EMG in lab already, electromyograms. And uh, if you were to measure uh, brain waves, we talked about EEGs, electroencephalograms and graphs earlier in the semester. So by using an EKG, we can tell how the heart's doing. We can talk about the performance of the SA node and the AV node. We know if there's any issues with the conduction system, is the, are the electrical signals traveling as quickly around the heart as they should be? And we can also look at the strength of the contraction, how strong is the muscle contracting. An abnormal pattern in an EKG can tell us an awful lot about one's heart's health.
So in basic EKG, there are some waves that we're going to see on the EKG. You've all seen these before. Uh, they are le lettered P, Q, R, S, and T. No, I do not know why they chose these letters. I'm sure there's a good reason historically, but I'm not aware of what it is. During the P wave, a rather small blip on the EKG, this represents the atrial depolarization. You can imagine that as sodium is rushing in, there's an electrical difference going on here, and that electrical difference can be picked up in the EKG leads. Uh, then there's going to be a QRS complex. This is a much stronger, most dominant uh, spike on the EKG, and this is referring to the ventricular depolarization. It makes sense this is larger because the ventricle is such a much um, a larger muscle mass. During this time, the, the ventricles are depolarizing. Also during this time, the atria are going to be repolarizing, but that activity is masked, overcome by the uh, amplitude of the QRS complex. And then there will be a T wave, and the T wave represents on the EKG when the ventricles are repolarizing. The intervals uh, from the start of one of these waves to another point on the EKG are also very, very important. We discussed earlier how um, when the SA node fires, that that signal then goes to the AV node. There's a certain amount of time that that should take. And then there's a certain amount of time for the entire cardiac cycle to occur. So these timing of intervals are very, very important and something that you'll be measuring uh, rather extensively in lab. So the P to R interval is the start of the atrial depolarization to the start of the ventricular depolarization. This should be less than 200 milliseconds, okay? Um, anything over 200 milliseconds would indicate that there's a problem in the conduction pathway. The signal is not getting from the SA node to the AV node in a timely manner. Then there's a QT interval, and this is the time for the intervals to undergo a single cycle. So starts at the end of the PR interval and goes to the end of the T wave. And again, this can be lengthened or changed through a series of uh, medications or conduction problems or other damage to the heart. So let's take a look at a typical EKG. Uh, again, we're talking about 800 milliseconds as the average cardiac cycle. And so we're going to start that at the beginning of P until the next initiation of P. That would be 800 milliseconds. The little P wave, little P blip here, is... Again, the atrial depolarization. Then this huge QRS complex, that represents the ventricular depolarization. And also, underneath there is the atrial repolarization. And then the T wave represents the ventricular repolarization. The P to R interval here, and the Q to T interval here. On the y-axis, we have millivolts, so the amount of electrical disturbance that's measured in the EKG. Now, when you see an abnormal EKG, then that can tell us a lot about the heart. So 5% of the population, maybe some of you, experience a few abnormal heartbeats each day. Not a big issue, um, unless that arrhythmia is producing or decreasing the overall efficiency of the heart, that is not a concern. So all of us throw a few extra, you know, um, heartbeats into the cycle, kind of disrupts the normal cycle. But again, in a small amount, those arrhythmias are not of clinical concern. Uh, one of those are premature atrial contractions, PACs. And these often occur, uh, you know, in regular normal people. There's momentary interruption of the normal cycle. And this can happen under greater stress, after having some caffeine, you'll have to throw some more uh, of these atrial contractions. Uh, different drugs can also do this. And typically, uh, it's not affecting the overall heartbeat. So it's not something that's too concerned. So here you can see that there's a premature atrial contraction. And this looks like a pretty normal wave, right? So... Here's a P wave, sorry, there's a little P wave, there's a little P wave, there's a little P wave, okay. But you can see that this has certainly come prematurely. There isn't much time 
between this wave and this wave. So it's a premature atrial contraction. Again, a little bit of an irregularity in the uh, rhythm, but nothing to be too concerned about. Uh, one that we'll be also looking at in lab will be uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, this is when um, the impulses are going as up to 500 beats per minute. So your heart is basically trying to beat 500 times a minute. Instead of an organized contraction, the atrial wall will basically quiver, just kind of shake. Well, if that's happening, you can imagine that the ventricles are not going to be um, the ventricles are not going to be getting blood. There's no actual squeezing going on. The atria are non-functioning. And since about 70% of the blood does flow passively into the ventricles, this may go on for some time, right? So when the atria squeeze, right, 70% of the blood just passes down to the ventricles. There isn't a lot of, of contraction power in the atria. So this can be going on un undiagnosed, if you will, in older individuals, this atrial fibrillation. And again, what you see here is all these P waves, right? Basically, all these P waves are occurring. So the atria are, the SA node is firing, and you still have ventricular, you still have the QRS occurring, you still have the ventricles contracting. But you may not, again, this may not show up, um, you may not know this is happening until you have an EKG. Another one are PVCs. Uh, this is when premature ventricular contractions. This is going to occur when those Purkinje cells or uh, the um, AV node is going to depolarize and trigger prematurely. Uh, this could be called an ectopic pacemaker. So typically it's the SA node that runs the show in the heart. But ectopic means out of place. So it's possible that a person has a few cells that are uh, incorrectly signaling for the heart to contract. A few of them know the problem. A few PVCs, again, not that uncommon. A slight irregularity in the pattern, not dangerous. But um, if there was an increase in the number of PVCs, then it could be a, a bigger issue. Again, you'll be looking at all of these in lab. So here we see uh, P waves and T waves that are marked. P wave, T wave, P wave, T wave. And do you see on here the premature? Do you see this, right? That PVC, there's no P wave before that QRS. So the QRS fired on its own, if you will. And so that it would be your PVC on this EKG. There are also ventricular tachycardia. This is simply when uh, the heart is beating um, very, very quickly, and um, also known as VTAC. And so four or more PVCs without a normal heartbeat. So now we're getting into a, a really more serious uh, cardiac arrhythmia. So again, you see here, all these QRS complexes are firing, but you don't see a nice little P wave occurring. Then there's ventricular fibrillation, or V-fib. Uh, this is basically cardiac arrest. So at this point, what's happening is that the ventricles are quivering. Okay, Before we had atrial fibrillation. Here we have ventricular fibrillation. Now the ventricles are quivering, and blood is not being pumped properly out to the aorta and to the brain. And basically, this is cardiac arrest, and death is imminent unless this can get fixed. So if you have V-fib, we take the shock paddles, right, and we try to shock the heart back to its resting rhythm, get it back out of fib and defib, right, take it out of this irregular or this crazy pattern. So please look over the EKG. Again, this will be part of your pre-lab. When you're doing your lab six pre-lab, you're going to have three pages, uh, three one-sided pages to do and this is going to talk about the EKG and the electrical con con uh, conduction system of the heart. So this should all be reviewed for you through lab, as well as doing the homework assignments on mastering and completing the quiz on the heart. Uh, that'll be the end of this presentation on uh, the cardiovascular system. The next lecture will be posted soon. 
and we'll go through section three, basically uh, 1917 through 23. And we'll talk about how all this cardiac output and blood flow is coordinated and put together, and we'll also talk about blood pressure.